Okay, so we've established that experts maybe have wider knowledge or, or um, more access to their knowledge, but what is the function of knowledge in general? Why do we carry information around in our heads? How is that helpful to us? Well, one thing that knowledge does for us is it helps us to develop our schemas. Now, I've alluded to schemas in previous lectures, but let's go ahead and formally define a schema. A schema is a framework for organizing and interpreting information. You carry around in your head this understanding of which events out in the world are connected to each other, you know, what things seem to cause what other things. Um, you have schemas for concepts such as yourself, right? And all these details about what it means to be you and what kind of person you are and all those things, that's all housed in your schema called self-concept. Um, so we have those kinds of frameworks for all sorts of different kinds of information. And we're going to talk about this more and more as the quarter goes on. Um, but what we, what I can say with great confidence is that your frameworks for understanding and interpreting information probably differ from anybody else's, from mine, from anybody else's, because our frameworks are developed through our experience with the world. And we've all had different experiences with the world, different reinforcements, different punishments, different, um, you know, actual events that we've experienced. Um, the people that we've come in contact with behave differently and have different motives. Um, we have all sorts of things that are different. And so while there are a lot of similarities in how we organize information, there are a lot of differences. And that means that um, our individual understanding of the world can vary. So we each have to develop our schemas based on our experiences with the world. Another function of knowledge is interpreting the meaning of events by activating our existing knowledge base. Um, so when we have an experience, we can impose some top-down processing by saying, oh, this reminds me of something else that I've experienced. Um, oh, this goes into this other category of experience that I've had before. Um, things like that. We can impose some meaning because we have existing knowledge, right? And so it allows us to um, have fewer times where we're really completely confused. Um, I was just watching and I can't remember what show I was watching, but I was just watching a TV show because it's summer. So I'm, you know, watching TV and okay, honestly, I watch a lot of TV anyway. But anyway, so this woman was describing how uh, an accident occurred and uh, she said, well, honestly, I was I was just frozen and I I didn't even I didn't even know what was going on. And that's really common in something as shocking as your first accident. Um, or the first time that you've seen something like this, you're like, what? I don't even know what to do with this. Um, when you actually encounter something brand new, you one of the reasons why it's scary or it is um, shocking is because it's nothing like anything that we've ever seen before and we don't know what to do with it. We're coming up as I'm as I'm recording this, it's August 31st. So we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and they're getting ready to show a bunch of um, you know, History Channel is getting ready to show a bunch of different movies, documentary type movies about, you know, what was going on that day and stuff like that. I have to tell you, I, w I watched live on the morning, I watched live the towers collapse. And when the first one collapsed, I watched it on TV. Um, when the first one collapsed, we it was me and my husband and then my sister-in-law and her husband standing in the kitchen watching it on this tiny TV because none of us wanted to pull away and like move to the other room that had a bigger TV. So we're all watching it on this like 10 inch TV. And um, the building started to collapse and we were all like moving closer to the TV going, what is happening? What What is that? Because as it was collapsing, like uh, uh, dust and stuff was coming up to sort of replace where the building had been as it was going. So we were like, "What? what's happening? And then finally, I think it was my brother-in-law who says, I think the building's collapsing. And then all of a sudden it made sense once he was able to impose like, oh, that's what it is. We all went, oh, it was like a pancake just flattening it on itself. And it was making this horrible noise. And all of us were just like, what, what? I don't know. I've never seen anything like this before. Luckily, that doesn't happen that often. And the older you get, the fewer things will be truly novel to you. 
right? You'll have this base of existing knowledge that allows you to filter information as it comes through and impose meaning on the fly so that fewer and fewer things will be that kind of shocking. Um, another thing that, that our existing knowledge does for us is it fills in gaps in our sensory input. So for example, sometimes when you're talking on your phone and the other person starts breaking up, you still can kind of figure out what they're talking, what they mean, what words must have been there because um, you have enough experience with that person. You have enough experience with what you're talking about that a couple of missing words aren't going to really bother you, right? It's, it's still intelligible. You can fill in those gaps. You can make logical guesses about what was probably there. And so um, that's just a really good example of how our existing knowledge base oftentimes will fill in gaps. Now, of course, sometimes it will fill in the gaps incorrectly. And so you will assume that the person said um, something different than they really did because you're like, you're guessing. Um, we see this sometimes with people who are starting to have... Um, a lot of blind spots in their in their vision. As we get older, um, little bits of our retina, they, which sloughs off every day and you replace cells all the time, but little bits of it will start to kind of build up on their retina, making little blind spots. And a person might not even be aware of these blind spots that are now present on their actual eye. And they don't, they don't even notice it's there because their brain fills in the missing details. And they won't find out that they had this gap until they have a car accident. Um, they've run over a piece of furniture that was in the driveway, but that they didn't see because it fell in their blind spot and their brain assumed it was a, it was a free and open driveway who would have furniture on the driveway, right? So you just drive over it. Um, that's when a lot of times people will start to become aware that they've got a blind spot or they'll trip over something and they'll be like, I didn't even see, how did I not see that? Well, it fell on your blind spot. So your brain will fill in gaps and sometimes incorrectly. Sometimes it'll fill in those gaps with what it assumes would, would most likely be there um, and you can end up with problems. Knowledge also allows us to make reasonable assumptions about what's likely to happen in the future, right? Um, we, I think this has been one of the most frustrating things about um, coronavirus, the COVID um, you know, pandemic has been that no matter what knowledge you have about how the world works, it's not helping in our ability to predict what's likely to happen in the future. I remember in March of 2020, as uh, you know, I was administering the final test that we were going to be able to have in the winter quarter, and then we were all you know, shutting down. Um, I said to my students, I can't believe I'm not going to be back here until September, right? Because we were skipping spring for sure. I always teach online for summer. So I just assumed we would be back in the fall. And then, of course, we were not back in fall of 2020. Um, and then throughout the year, we kept saying, well, maybe we'll be back in winter. Well, maybe we'll be back in spring. And then ultimately, we stopped saying that. And they said, let's just give up and cancel it for the rest of the year. It's very anxiety inducing to keep wondering what's going to happen. So let's just commit and not do it. Um, but all things that we've ever known ever before did not allow us to make predictions about what was happening in this scenario. And as I'm lecturing right now, you know, end of August, we're assuming that things are going to be different um, coming up. But, you know, we still there. That's what has produced a lot of anxiety for people, because we we can't rely on our existing knowledge to make reasonable assumptions about the future. And that makes it us anxious. Right. It's it's very um, unsettling that our knowledge base is not helping us to make good predictions about the future. All right, now how is our semantic memory structured? This was something that when I was in graduate school, I was working on my PhD in cognitive psychology, and I still did not have, after all the training I, I had experienced so far, did not have a very good grasp of what the structure of our semantic memory store must be like. Um, so I don't want you guys to, to walk away from a cognitive psychology class without a good grasp of what our knowledge structure probably looks like. Um, first off, we have a computer model that helps us to explain what our semantic memory structure is probably like. So you've got all your perceptions, you know, all the things that are, um, you know, sensations have come in, you're understanding what they mean based on your previous knowledge, all that kind of stuff. Um, you've got your normal thinking, you've got your memory structures, all of those things come together to produce your interpretations of what's going on in the world. Um, that's the basic, um, see how everything's kind of in a box. Your perceptions are separate from your thinking, which is separate from your memory. And those all have to combine and work together in some fashion to produce your interpretations. 
the assumption of the computer model is that the that your brain works like a computer does using binary code. So the connections between neurons, what we call synapses, are either on and they're sharing information or off and they're not sharing information. If you haven't taken introductory psychology um, and or physiological psychology, I'll just give you a little brief um, neuron lesson. You can fast forward over this if you've already had it. Um, but the idea is that when you have um, one neuron that contains um, one little detail of a memory, it can share that little detail if it gets activated and is motivated to pass that message along down the axon and out the um, synapse. If for some reason that synapse doesn't get activated, it won't share its detail into the memory. So if you're trying to retrieve information or you're trying to make a good decision or something like that, and that neuron doesn't fire because it didn't get enough um, activation to trigger a, a, an action potential, it's not going to contribute its knowledge. On the flip side, if you act accidentally activated a neuron that's not involved in this memory or this decision or whatever, accidentally activate it, it will share its detail, even though that detail has nothing to do with the current context. And that can lead you to draw incorrect conclusions also. Um, so misfiring either way um, can contribute to faulty um, logic, stuff like that. Now, in your semantic memory store, you have a bunch of concepts. These are mental groupings of details that pertain to an object or to a class of objects. Um, so you have, for example, in your semantic memory store, the concept of chair, right? Or seat. Maybe I'll say seat, right? Something that could be sat upon. And in your concept of seat would be maybe that it needs to have a flat surface, right? For you to sit on. It might include um, something about the seat being some, somewhat elevated so that your feet are lower than your butt. So you're not on the floor, something like that. Um, it might include the detail of um, like a back so that you could lean back on it. So it's not a stool, for example. Um, so I've got all these little details that I'm homing in on that makes a chair different from these other things, stools or ground or, you know, a step or something like that. Um, this concept allows us to group together all the details that go along with the concept of chair. Like what does it mean to have a seat, right? Um, now, within that concept, you have a prototype, the best example of that concept. Um, your prototypes are going to be based on your experience with various examples of those concepts. So your perfect prototypical example of a chair might look different from my perfect prototypical example of a chair because we've had different experiences with chairs, perhaps. Um, so when we talk about semantic uh, memory structure, the assumption is that we've got all this information stored in these con con these conceptual groupings and that there's um, one constellation of details that is your best example, your prototype, your best example of that um, concept. All right, I think I'll stop here and then we'll talk about the different, um, uh, you know, theories of how things are organized and connected in our memories. So we'll see you in the next segment.